Hey, everybody, welcome back to Real Estate Today. And this is your glimpse of what's really going on in the marketplace, debunking the myths of what's actually happened. I'm one of your hosts, Jeff Beggins, and here with my brother. I'm Craig Beggins. Hello, everybody. And our brother from another mother. Mike Puma. So background, just those of you who haven't, been, haven't seen us before. So we run several real estate companies with about 10 brick and mortar and a big virtual company in the state of Florida with 600 plus agents doing about a few thousand transactions a year, over a billion in sales and 60,000 transactions, 31 years. So we've seen a lot, right? We've seen a lot and we've seen good. We've seen bad. We've seen ugly. We've seen indifferent and we've seen pretty much all of it except for this market, but we've seen enough markets to know what's happening. And so what we want to do today is share with you from our experience, right, which is a lot of it, what we believe is going on in the market and what we believe is BS that's being told in the marketplace and to empower, educate, and encourage you to do what's good for you in the stage of life that you're in. And it's really simple. We don't ever talk people into doing things that's not right for them. And if life requires a move, move. If it doesn't, maybe don't, right? But let's talk about what's going on in there. So We've got a couple slides that we want to share, and I think it's going to start there. So let's start there. We're going to share. I'm going to share my screen, and we're going to go through a couple of slides, and then we're going to chat and banter about them all up there. So, Craig, you hear it. You're the broker of record for Baggins for the, the company there. So let's talk about the fear factor of the media and, oh, my gosh, what's going on? Market's going to crash. I'm going to wait until prices come down before I buy. Legitimate thought when you read some of the headlines, and also, what's your take on what's going on in the market right now? Um, my first thought is, I don't like the media for anything they say because it's all slanted one way or another, right? The fact of the matter is, right now is a, it's always a good time for real estate. It just depends on the situation you're in. You mentioned it earlier. If you're not happy where you are, you're not a tree. You can move, right? I think the unique thing that's happening right now is the slide you on the screen. We've never seen a market like this where houses have literally doubled or tripled in value over the last couple of years. And this year was supposed to be devastating with prices falling. And all that we've seen really is the price appreciation declining. So as houses are going up slower than they were, but they're still going up, which is kind of weird because interest rates have more than doubled, which typically makes houses less affordable, but people have so much equity they can afford to sell their home and move into another one, right? And then what we've done as an industry, and I include mortgage professionals in this industry, is we've gotten really creative, right? We're buying down interest rates because we've got so much equity in the market. Sellers, the ones that aren't too greedy, are willing to negotiate, pay points, pay closing costs, the home builders are really driving the market because they're buying down interest rates and they're paying closing costs, which is making the houses way more affordable than they ever were before. And, you know, we just came through the uh, supply chain disruption, which we're not totally out of yet, but we came through that shining and now we're building houses and getting windows and getting roofs and getting plywood and everything's coming back together. So it's all shaping up to be a great time to buy real estate right now. And I'm not just saying that because I'm a real estate broker, yeah. I'm watching it happen. Well, and the, and also, you guys know that there is no real estate market, correct? correct. There is, there is a, a ton of micro markets that combine make up an overall market, but there is no market per se, right? So if you have a waterfront home, that's not a market. If you've got a waterfront home that's built in the last couple of years above floodplain, that's different than just a waterfront house that was built in the 80s. Right, which is different than one that has a new seawall exposed. There's a million little micro markets. So there are some micro markets that have too much competition. And as we know, supply and demand runs the entire world, right? Everything is supply and demand. Everything's supply and demand. Consumer confidence and supply and demand. And we've got an issue in some micro markets right now where there's a lot of supply. When there's a lot of supply and demand doesn't match it, then naturally prices will adjust on that micro market. Okay. But there are other micro markets where we have no real supply and still a lot of demand. So as soon as something comes on the market, it's snapped up. There's that's that's opposite supply side, right? That's the de demand side. 
in the world. So everything changes out there in the market. Now, I'm let me de debunk something because I had some people and I, I'm set up like you guys are probably on the Zillow and the realtor.com and your local real estate websites and you have your safe searches up for your neighborhoods. If you don't, you should, right? And then you start to say, oh my gosh, $50,000 price cut, $100,000 price cut. Oh my God, there goes the market, it's falling. No, market's not falling. The, the seller was greedy, picked a crazy ass price for their property. They didn't get it. So they have to come back down to reality, right? On what's going on. But that's not a drop market. If they, they bought it for 650, they put it on the market for a million one, right? Because that worked last year, but it didn't. This this year, so they got to drop it down to the 950 mark, right? Is that really prices falling or is it still up 350 grand over last year, right? So you've got to watch what you're hearing and check out the sources because I was talking to a good friend of mine and um, and his quote was, I can't wait for the market to crash so I can go buy some real estate, right? And, and that's not the only person I've heard that from. And that's logical when you say, oh my gosh, we're going into a recession, Fed interest rates hikes 14 in a row, right? Everything's happening. We have some bank collapses. I mean, if you wanted to make a case for it, for the un, that non-existent market having problems, right? I, it's easy to do so. But what we're here to do is talk about facts, right? Real facts inside the industry right now. There's something for you to consider. 2008, not a very good time or a really good time, depending on which side of the supply and demand curve you're sitting on, right? So it depends on what's going on. A lot of people made a lot of money during that time. A lot of people, unfortunately, lost a lot of money. But it's an issue of jobs, economy, financing. Everything rolled into one, created that weird market that we're in, that we were in back then. Now, this is not anywhere near that market. And this is this one slide that we're starting with. Let's talk about it. So well, let, let's talk about this for a second, though, because the 2008 market, there were so many people that were upside down to foreclosure if it was a crisis. Yes. And we had to invent a new tool. I never remember that was called short sales. Yes. And we did thousands of them. Yes, we did. We <laughs> had a house, we put it on the market. The seller would get, let's say the house he owed 300 on it. We had an offer of 200. The seller would sign the contract saying, yep, I'll take 200 if the bank agrees. And then we'd go work the bank for months on end to see if we can get that house done. In the meantime, nobody paid the taxes. Nobody did this. Nobody fixed the plumbing. Mean, none of that stuff happened. So a bunch of crappy houses on the market at really cheap prices, right? Yep. And that's because nobody had equity. So real life story, this is last year, an ex-employee of ours, um, her new husband bought a house for his ex-wife. She moved in. She didn't make a payment for 18 months. We put that house on the market for sale at market value. We sold it in a week. They had enough money to pay back all the 18 months worth of missed payments and walked away with, with cash in their pocket. Not a short sale. Yeah. Potentially a foreclosure. It was Liz Pendens out there. The bank was going to come take it. Bank doesn't want it. So we put it on the market and had enough money to satisfy the bank and pay off. Didn't put money in the seller's pocket. Right. That's not 2008. And today, this is this is true stats. This is from um, coming out keeping current current matters, right? Which is something that we kind of follow for some industry stats and trends. So 39% of all US households own their homes free and clear. 39%, four out of 10 on your street have no mortgage. That never really happened before. It's unbelievable to see these trends on here. We'll add to that, those houses are now worth twice as much as they were three years ago. So if you had a 250 house, now you have $500,000. Here's another change we thought about, at least in Florida, we have homestead exemption rights. And your first, if a married couple, your first $500,000 in gain is tax free. Yep. So a lot of people are saying, huh, if I sold my house now, I make 500,000 bucks tax-free. I've never had 500,000. I'm never going to have the opportunity to make 500,000 our windfall on anything. Maybe I'll sell my house and I'll rent for a while. That's right. Or All new options. Down, or right? put it down on a new home. Or put it down and buy two investment homes and, and a new one to live in. That's right. All different well, opportunities. Right? The, flip what side, the, the flip side, too, is I think one of the one of the things that this slide kind of highlights too that will play a huge role as we continue into the future here is this right here is a prime example why supply in many markets is going to continue to be a problem right. because 39 percent of people have zero mortgage so what does that mean 
Well, there are a large percentage of those people are sitting there going, wait a minute, why would I ever sell this house? Number one, I don't owe anything on it, right? I like not having a mortgage. That's one camp. The other camp is going to say, well, even if I do find something else, I have 100% equity in this home. I'll use some of that. I'll buy the second house and I'll rent this one out. I don't owe anything. So that's just pure cash. So now paying off the mortgage of the second one that I'm, I may end up with a mortgage on. There's a lot of factors there that will cause a lot of the people, 39%, to say, you know what? I'm going to keep my house. And the fact that they're going to keep their house or stay in that house longer is going to limit supply in many markets, right? And this, so that's going to continue to, to play a snowball effect into the supply part of the market. I agree 100%. That's right. So look at this seven out of 10 homes are sitting with greater than 50% equity. So let's let's play this out for a second. So Bob and Mary own their home. It's either free and clear or they have more than 50% equity. Bob loses his job. Now let's not make light of the situation. There are people losing their jobs. There is a ton of merger and acquisition. There's a lot of right sizing, quote unquote, inside companies. Earnings are not what they were before. Companies are making streamlined layoffs and cuts, right? Let's be realistic, it's happening. So there will be some people losing their jobs and that sucks, right? but it's an economic cycle of what's going on. So, but when Bob and Mary lose their home, their job this time, they still have a few hundred thousand dollars sitting in trapped money in their home that should they need to sell it because they can't keep up with the payments, they're gonna walk away with a lot of cash that they could downsize into another home or rent to your point, Craig, for a little while and not get hurt. And 08, when they lost their jobs, there was no equity in their home. So they had no choice but to lose it. And there was no equity to keep. There's none of that going on. Right. So that's why we're not going to have a problem. They're not going to lose their home. They're not going to let their home go down. They're not going to stop maintaining it. They're going to, if they need to, unfortunately, they're going, they're not going to be in a position to be an equity line, are they? Because they don't have a job. Right. So that's not a real option, but they do have equity to sell it and be in a good place and then figure things out and then move again. Right. So that's what this slide means is why it's not an 08 scenario, just because of the tremendous amount of equity sitting out there, too. So very important distinctions here. So what this is doing for you watching is saying, okay, this is not like them because a lot of people want to say it's like them, but it's not. And here's the proof. There's some pretty good things coming on here. Average days on the market. <laughs> this, this, this one kills me because, you know, we do, I do a training class most days of the week, 8.30 in the morning, and I always ask the agents, what's going on? And it's still, I got an offer I got 20, I got a new listing. I got 23 offers and it sold over asking. We're, we're still doing that. In some micro markets. In some markets. Now we just picked up a listing. This is a fun one. Um, and a neighborhood. I live here. There's another neighborhood here. My neighborhood, there's two houses for sale. That's it. This neighborhood, there's 55 houses for sale. This one we just got was an expired listing. It was on the market for 90 days. And they, let's see, they bought it for 365 and they put it on the market at 625. They owned it for less than a year, right? It didn't sell in 90 days. Our agent got the listing. We put on the market at 565, which is still a hell of a profit on a 365 acquisition a year ago, right? So the word, the word on the street in that neighborhood is all the sellers are being greedy and asking for more than their houses are worth. So that somebody is going to come in and they're going to undercut and they're going to create a new market. So I think that's good advice for the sellers that are on the market now. If you're not, if your house is not selling in 90 days, you're overpriced. Or your house needs work and the buyer doesn't have the cash to fix it up on their own. But even then we have renovation loans for people like that. But this is a telling stat here because look at the look at the days on the market. That's a typical house is selling in a month, less than a month. A year ago, they were selling in two weeks, right? On average, this is the average market, which we there's not really a market, but the average market time across the U.S. according to Association National Association of Realtors is that. So with 14 days, it peaked up in February, right to 34 days was the average, and then now it's back down to 20. Um, 22 days as far as the April stat, that's the most recent one they have. But what's going on there, right? So rates were going up, right? Rates were going up, Fed rates were going up, mortgage rates are going up, 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 up. 
and they peaked around February in the sevens, right? And that's, we're still hovering around the seven, a little low, lower than the sixes. You can get adjustable rates and the fours. I mean, there's still private capital markets always solve problems, right? So you're going to start seeing the 40 year AM mortgages. You're going to start seeing the three to five year adjustable rate mortgages. You're going to see things that are going to combat this because we're in a free market capitalistic society. And that's the things that happen. But people came to terms that it's not going to eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 15, 18. Because guys, let's let's be realistic. We've never seen this. We are we are coming through a shakeout of a global shutdown pandemic where multiple trillions of dollars were printed in every country around the world to try to stay alive. Literally, right? We've never seen that happen before, and inflation went out of control. So we may not like the rates the way they are, but thank gosh somebody's doing something about it to bring inflation under control. And we're going to have to ride the waves, right? So it went up and up and up 14 times in a row. And everyone's like, gosh, is it going to be 20 times in a row, 40 times in a row? We don't know. But in February, we notice it's not going to be 18 or 20 or 30 times in a row. It's going to be 14 with maybe one or two little ones here and there to tweak it. So the sky's not falling. The economy is not dead. It's going to recover. And it's in the process of recovering right now, which mm -hmm. is the lesson that was learned in February. And people said, well, shit. Seven's not that bad. Six and a half's not that bad. I know we'll be back into the fives and maybe the fours in a couple of years. I, I could eat an extra couple hundred bucks a month and I can refine a couple of years. That's the long, that's an explanation of this chart right here saying, okay, it's going to be okay. And people started buying again and people start buying again. Supply and demand curves come in there and they start selling faster, which is what this graph is showing. Yeah. We'll talk about inflation and uh, interest rates going up. Why are they raising interest rates We're fundamentally? To slow down the economy. They can't slow down the economy. It's too strong. So you're yeah. talking about a strong economy that the workforce keeps growing, jobs keep going, wages are going up, and they're going up higher than anybody can sustain. So they're trying to slow it down. And it's working. It's working. We're doing, building some big projects. Interest rates have gotten to the point where it knocks out so many millions of dollars in profit. It's positive, right? is a realistic thought that wasn't there a year ago because why spend $8 million more than you have to when you can just wait and, re and recoup that back? Now, that's just one example. And then you're seeing companies that were thinking about expanding saying, well, we had to buy another building and why are we going to have to pay 8% interest when we used to have to pay 3% interest? We don't really need to go into Dallas right now. Let's just wait, right? And then what did that do? It didn't hire the Dallas crew. Those guys didn't get their jobs. And it's the trickle down, sideways, up, down, whatever thing you want to call it. But when people don't spend money, things slow down. So they're trying so what, to people stop spending money. Look look what's happening in the commercial real estate space, right? Yep. Class A is getting hit hard. Yep. Why? Because companies are sitting back going, wait a minute. I can have my 400 employees located in Tampa work from their homes. We'll get rid of the building space there. We'll get rid of that rent. I can give them all raises. And now what happens though, think about the factors of this, the economy on that side of it from the company, leasing space, paying taxes, all that, that goes away entirely, but the individual folks are making more money and still are employed, right? So that part of the economy stays super strong, but the global footprint that a lot of these companies have is going away or shrinking tremendously and that was a big play into the global economy. So we're going to see it shift. And I don't know if we've ever really seen anything quite like that before, right? We've never had quite this interesting factors kind of play out. And so that is going to be interesting to, to see what effects that has on inflation and everything else. Because to Craig's point, they're not slowing this thing down um, by by doing the things that worked in the past, right? It's not gonna work that way because this is a different future. Well, here's the other problem too. So let's say I'm Chase Bank and I loan Craig $8 million for his um, new corporate headquarters eight years ago, right? And he built it out for his 500 employees that don't come to work anymore. They just don't. And he doesn't That's need familiar. to build <laughs> And now the problem is, He's going to say, I don't need this building anymore. And Chase has a mortgage on this building right now. And he's going to look with his attorneys for the ways to stop paying that mortgage. And when that mortgage goes into default, now you've been on bank boards before, what happens to the balance sheet of that bank when there's an $8 million asset 
that's in default. It hurts. It hurts, and, and it takes away their ability to lend money into the future. So now Mike comes up with an idea to develop an RV resort outside of Kissimmee in Orlando, and he needs to borrow eight million bucks. Chase would love to do it, but now they can't, right? And then it's a higher risk factor. So guess what? Now, if he does do it, he's going to be syndicated with three or four other banks, and the rates are now going to be 12%. And now his profit performa was going to show that he projected six, and now it's 12, and he doesn't do it. So now the, the engineers don't have a job. The road guys don't have a job. So that's all. This We've never seen all of this. But at the same time, the company's profitable. The employees are making money. So the only one getting hammered right now is the bank. Right. Well, look at the supply and demand game of that, too, because now you're going to have excess supply of potential space. So even yeah. those companies that do need physical space, look at the negotiating power they have. They're going to want to pay less. Right. Because if I'm if I'm a personal injury law firm that is now the biggest tenant in that building and I still want space, but you've got a shit ton of it. And my lease well, is up. Yeah, guess what I'm doing? I'm shopping around, right? And I'm not paying okay. what I was paying, not even close. So now rates on that side of things are going to fall. So again, very different game than what we put in the residential side, but everything has a reaction, right? And there, there's a lot going on on that side of things that I do think will somewhat trickle down into, into the residential side as well. Right. But take, we sometimes we digress, but it's all important, guys, because it all plays, it's interwoven, right? It's all interwoven on this one. But the point on this slide here is that the sky's not falling, and people realized that a couple months ago. So they're saying, well, it sucks to pay seven, but it's okay because I know, let's do the math real quick. The difference between seven and five is a couple hundred bucks, right? And so the reality of it, it's a couple hundred bucks times a year. It's a couple grand for the year. Like, could you stomach an extra couple thousand dollars or a couple hundred dollars a month for two years in order to get a really good deal on a home, right? Yes, you can. And that's what people are realizing that it's worth it to do it now because let's say it's 16 grand over two years. I can get 16 grand back in a negotiation with a good agent with repairs or rate buy downs, all kinds of things. So that's the market that we're in. We'll talk about that. In a few. Let's change slides. This one I think is huge because if you're going to go to supply and demand, Look at the demand that's pent up right now that our households making over 150 grand a year, right? They're renting. They don't have to rent, guys. They're renting because it's convenient, but stuck in their brain is, man, 7% is tough, but I'm spending 100% interest right now in my nice apartment, right? And there are 3 million households paying 100% interest right now on their home. Three million of them. And you got to know several it's factors like... there. A lot of factors there, right? How many? How many of those tried to buy a home in the last two years and got frustrated because they kept getting beat out and couldn't get a home that yeah. are now like, screw it. I'll guess I'll just rent. A lot of them. A lot. Well, that's of them, my right? favorite story. And just put math to it. There were times our 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 record offer was with 113 offers in one house. Yep. How many people got it? Who know? One. So 112 people did it. So they kept playing and trying and trying. Hell, I was at the restaurant the other day. I met a couple from New York. They're on their 11th offer on their house in New York, not New York City, in New York suburbs. And they're up to 90,000 over asking price and they still can't get one. There's a pent up demand. I've told all of our agents, and if you're an agent watching this too, go back to your pipeline from a half, year and a half or two years ago. A lot of those people just threw in the towel and said, screw it. I can't compete in this market. I'm just going to stay renting. And then what happened? Their lease is up and they got to move. And now there's a little more supply in the market and there's new houses coming out of the ground and it's a whole new world. And herd mentality is going to screw a lot of people because these 3 million people are going to read the headline in 18 months from now that rates are back into the fives, housing markets back on fire. And they're going to say, honey, it's time, let's go. And now they're going to be one of the 19 offers that are coming in on an open house on a Sunday. And it's just stupid. Right. It's stupid to do that when you can be the only offer in some micro markets right now and have a lot more leverage in your negotiations. Right. Well, look at Craig. Look at that neighborhood. Right. Do you think I can get a better deal as a buyer when there's 52 homes on the market in that neighborhood? 100. Yes. 
If you're in, I can get a better, I can get a better deal. I can go to one of those 52 sellers. I guarantee you, I'm going to get one of them to give me some concessions. I'm going to get one of them to say, yeah, Mike, we'll buy down your rate. Yeah, we'll give you some closing costs. Yeah, we'll lower the price. One of 52 is going to give me what I want. Probably more than one, but certainly one of those will. Versus if I go to buy in Craig's neighborhood right now, and there's two homes for sale, and I go to them and say, hey, you want, want to give me a deal? They're going to tell me to go pound sand because there's 27 other people that are looking in that same spot for two homes, right? right. And that's what's going to happen everywhere when rates get back into the fours and fives. That's right. So take advantage. That's if they get back to the four and five. I'm, I'm not in favor. Of, I'm in favor of it. I just don't think it's going to happen. Well, let's I want to talk about this real quick, though. So the more we had a mortgage got our salesman yesterday, and we were talking about the biggest problem most people have buying a home is their down payment, right? And so the way it works is if you put twenty percent down, the lender can sell that loan to a servicer on the secondary market and get it off their books and, and make a little bit of profit. If you put less than twenty percent down, you got to buy PMI, profit mortgage insurance because that's gonna ensure the bank that they can get their 20% down. So that's what private mortgage insurance does. And one of the strategies that was presented to us yesterday is you can prepay your PMI. So PMI is like one or 2%, depending on how much you put down. But the less money you put down, the higher the PMI is, but you can prepay your PMI, just like closing costs. And PMI could be $100, $200, $300 a month. And there's a way to save money in your mortgage. So you could just sell her to pay, in Mike's case, if you're $625 and your house, you bought it for $385 and it's going to sell for $585 now, you're still going to make $200 grand. 2%, $12,000. And uh, you're going to save three or $400 a month on your mortgage. And then we go, we can still pay, we can still pay the high price. It'll probably appraise. And then we take a little bit of extra money and we can buy down, buy down the interest rate. Right, that's what the smart buyers are doing right now. Yeah, it's it's, it's not about the price of the house with the month the monthly payment, just like your car. Well, we did another example yesterday at the sales meeting at, at the beach offices. We were talking with the mortgage lender over here and saying, okay, so if it's a four hundred thousand dollar house, right? It's just simple math, and we wanted to buy the rate down by one percent, right? How mm -hmm. much does that cost? And in those numbers, it's four percent, right? So four percent of a four hundred thousand dollar house, six sixteen grand. Right, it's not far fetched to get a sixteen thousand dollar concession, no, right, for on a home sale. So now I I go as a as a strong agent for our buyer client who we have fiduciary, right, full disclosure, obedience, loyalty, confidentiality, and, and are physically contracted to go work on their behalf. We're going to go to that seller and we're going to negotiate hard because it's been on the market for eighty three days, and I know there's not another offer sitting around. So we're going to be fully approved, really strong, hard money in escrow. We love the house. We're ready to act. We're solid. We're real. But we want 16 grand in closing costs, right? So then now it's at closing. The sellers are going to buy down the interest rate by one full percent, right? And it costs the buyer nothing to go do. Now, why is that? Because in that micro market, that house has been on the market for 83 days and the sellers want to move. So for them, it's either time or money, right? That's always the, the interesting dynamic in life. You get time or you get money, you don't get both. So somebody is interested. And the fact they paid, they didn't pay 400 grand for their house years ago. They paid 280, right? And we know that because of public records and we could see what people bought in their house and how much their mortgage is and everything at the push of a button. So you have so many tools to go do this. So the point is interest rates don't matter when you have a great agent and you have a scenario in a micro market that works for your advantage. But that's the reason to go buy now, guys, because when rates do drop back down, um, and then this everybody's coming. doing this one. This negotiation tool is gone, right? You're going to say, I want 16 grand. Like, screw you. I got 18 other offers coming in from my open house this weekend. Buy. Because there's 3 million other people and make 150 grand a year that want to buy this house. And now the news said it's time, right? And then that's when it's going to happen. So this is the smart money. This is the time for the smart money right now. All right. Next slide. This is a historic look at the Fed funds rate. Okay. And it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. So this is not an anomaly. This is not ridiculous where we are. This is where we're sitting right here. And this is what interest rates have done since the 50s, right? And 
So it's not crazy. It's not like, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. It's not even close, right? This is a normal average type interest rate that we're in. And the reason why we had this little blip right here is because everybody thought we were all gonna die and everything was shut down and we had to print trillions of dollars and give money away to try to get things to happen. And thank God we didn't die, right? Doing that. This is when the global economy was screwed and we were trying to do everything in the world coming out of the 08 time period. This is when we literally thought we were all dead, right? So we don't want this to happen again. We really don't want this to happen again. So we're probably okay somewhere in this range here where we're heading back to. And that's uh, the, that. this is something to kind of come back into terms with. We're just short-term memory and we're spoiled. And yes, we, all of us wish that we can go by 2020 rates again, but you can't. I, mean, I don't wish for lockdown, global lockdowns either. So I'll pay a couple points if I need to. Here's what the chief economists are saying. Be prepared to jump on a dip in rates. Okay, they're already starting to prepare the herd mentality, right? And this is pretty respected sources here. This one, blurry, this one's not. Mortgage rates will drop with a 30-year fixed mortgage progressively falling to 6% this year and into the mid fives next year, okay? That's nice. This is Lawrence Young, right? the very respected National Association of Realtors chief economist, right? As of last week, these are the comments. That these are the predictions that what's going to happen on the interest rates. When I was people... telling somebody the other day, for those years when rates were three, 2.85, three and a half, yeah. what were we saying at that time? Do you remember? By now, this party is not going to last. You're going to- This is generationally low. You're never going to see it again. Yep. 2.85, 3%, 3.5%. If we get to 5.6, I think Lawrence is probably spot on there. And then depending on what the economy does, it's going to stick around that number for a while. So don't be waiting. I mean, I hope it happens for you, but don't be waiting for 2.85s again. No, and and God, if, if we do get 2.8s again, it sucks because that means we're in a global depression and they have to stimulate everything back and nobody well, wants that. <laughs> it does suck, but... Even if I bought it to six and it goes down to 2.8, guess what I do? Refinance. I refi yeah. into a 2.8, right? So yeah. my, and honestly, if we're really thinking about this, can I get a better deal right now if the rate's at six compared to even if it drops to 5.6 or five and a half? Probably, right? And if I can get a better deal now, there's not that big of a difference payment wise between six and 5.6. There's just no, not. There's not. Right. So if I can get a better deal now, it makes a lot more sense to pull the trigger now, buy at six, then hope to God that he's right and it drops another 0.4 down to 5.6. Right. So do not wait. If you're sitting here thinking it's not going to drop significantly below that 5.6, not for a long time. Right. right. So, Unless we have a major problem. And when we have a major problem, nobody wants that problem. Exactly. Right. This is the other one. Our forecast, this is from Michael Frantoni, the chief economist over at on the Mortgage Bankers Association. Our forecast for a 30-year mortgage is to be closer to 5.5 by the end of this year and drop a little lower next year. Right. Great. So everyone who's buying at seven is going to refinance when it gets into the mid fives. What's the rule of thumb? Point and a half? is when it's logical to drop your rate and refi, right? So these are good. So nobody's saying we're going to see 18s, right? No one's saying we're going to see eights and nines or tens. They're saying we peaked, we're going back down because the economy is getting under control, right? And that's beautiful, guys. It's beautiful on there. So this is real. This, these are the real facts about what's going on and telling you the situation here. This is medium sales price. This is an interesting one, right? So look how things are going up, the median sales price, and look what's going on to a little bit of the median sales price right now. Right? No, I want to clarify. That doesn't mean prices are falling. No. The rate of the appreciation is slowing. And people are buying less expensive homes. When you're looking at median sales price, it's the price of the average home. Correct. Because the builders are recognizing that with the purchasing power is smaller because of the interest rates. So rather than build the 450 homes, they're going to build the 375 homes because there's more people that can afford it with the way that the market is right now. Everything's well, like, demand. I talked to a builder the other day. He's building two houses, same floor plan, basically. His trust package on the one house was 47,000 bucks. 
He started the other one three months later. The trust package was seventeen thousand bucks. Yep. Right. Most builders have learned to do cost plus sales pricing, so he can sell that house for thirty thousand dollars less because the trust package was thirty thousand dollars less. Right. And trust package is a roofing system. Yes. Yes. I'm sorry. Right. So that's what's going on. Month supply of homes. Right. This is an interesting stat. I really like this a lot. The healthy market averages in the five six months. That's when you. That's when the it's a balanced market. Buyer, seller, equilibrium gets into that. We haven't had a balanced market since 2012, right? When it's dropped and it's dropped and it's dropped and it's dropped and we peaked in 2020, four and a half months, right? in that one time when everybody was locked down and couldn't leave their houses, that's that point in time. And then after that, everyone says, okay, I'm mad at my house that's forcing me to lock down and they moved. And then it dropped and then it went up and then it went down and it went up and it went down. Now it's down. 2.9 months supply of homes is where we're sitting right now. Yeah. And I like to define that term. That means if no new homes come on the market, we're going to run out of houses in less than three months. Correct. That's what it means. Correct. Yep. In the country. In, in the country. US. Nationwide. That's what's going on. So that kind of gives you a benchmark of how long it's going to take to sell your home. So this, I really like this too. So think about those 3 million home households that have 150 grand a year that are sitting on the sidelines waiting to pull the trigger because they are, okay? So let's think about what's the, what's coming our way and what's gonna happen to prices. This is the millennial, this is generations, right? You have the silent generation, the baby boomers, you have Gen X, millennials, and Gen Zs. Okay? Millennials are by far the biggest, um, way bigger than the baby boomers on there. And they are in their age right now of the 28 to the 34 age group co cohort, which is peak buying years. Right. So they are sitting in the peak buying years right now. In addition to many of them are the peak, their couples where they can 150 grand a year renting. Right. So they're bent to pent up demand. So when this one's pull the trigger, get out of their apartments and make a move, you're going to see some major waves happen. Right. It drives markets. Right. That's what demographics do. So to understand what's coming our way, this is important to figure this out. So as they get into their mid thirties and forties over the next few years, you're going to see a lot of home demand coming up down the market. So this is exciting to me to watch what's coming, coming down the pipeline. Yeah. Comments on that one. Now let, let's use your daughter, for example, Greg, right? My niece, yes. she is sitting in this age bracket right now, right? She's flat in the middle of it and she has a home and she is looking for a nicer home. She and has a home with a 3% fixed interest rate. And conventional yeah. wisdom says, conventional wisdom and father wisdom is telling her to keep her ass there. Yes. It's a 3% interest rate. And she and it's worth twice what she paid for. Right. So, but a nicer, prettier, shinier one came on the market and she wants it. Well, she wants to be in that neighborhood. It's not yeah. a prettier, shinier house. It's a prettier, shinier neighborhood. Okay. Which economically seems to be a smarter decision because it will appreciate it's more expensive than what she's in now substantially right? substantially and if things go up three percent four percent five percent a year not 12 or 18 or 50 percent but normal appreciation just do simple math is it is four percent of six hundred thousand as good as four percent of three hundred thousand which one makes you more money every year four percent of six hundred thousand okay so she wants it but rates are in the sevens High sixes and sevens. Well, she yeah. found a, a three one arm, a just the rate mortgage at four point eight seven to five. Okay. Which she'll she'll take that bet for three years. She gets that four point eight percent rate. And if it goes higher, it'll go higher. If it goes lower, she can refinance. Right. But it's still three years, she's safe. Still a few hundred dollars a month more than what she's paying right now. Not really, because she's got so much equity to pull out. She's gonna put a whopping down payment. Okay, which will drop it back down. So this is what exactly what we're talking about, guys, right? So this has never happened before. For her to have that much equity in the handful of years she's owned that home is unprecedented, coming out of a global pandemic, by the way, and that's the byproduct of it. So to not take advantage of that is pretty stupid, right? So now she's got a few hundred grand she did nothing for, right? And she gets it as a gift from sleeping for the last few years, and she can now put that down on a neighborhood that's going to go up because it's more desirable, right? So that's what you guys are watching right now. You're sitting on the same gift, right? So if there's any shot that you would rather be in a different home or a different neighborhood or a different 
lot or in the same street or just a different location or inside of the golf course, whatever it is, seriously consider doing it because that equity may not always be there and rates will always change and fluctuate. So this is the time. This is what we're doing is just showing you why things are going um, very well for all of us. The nation is standing on the front doorstep of the largest wave of home buying demand in U.S. history. I don't know about you, but I'm excited about statements like that. That's pretty good. And that's a good for everybody, for sellers, because there's a lot of demand. For buyers, not as much, you have a lot of competition coming up. So if you're a buyer in the next year or two, and you're able to buy right now, you might consider buying right now before you have to compete with all these people. That's our thoughts. No, this is industry jargon too. I mean, if you listen to the news, which I don't, but I get glimpses here and there and highlights, CBS, NBC, ABC, they're not telling stories like this. That's why it's cool that we're actually giving you guys the facts of what's really happening in the market. This so. is an interesting one. I'll zoom this in. What this is saying is this is the total existing home sales. And this are the new homes being built. And this is a 30-year fixed rates that are underlined here. So let me go up a little bit. So 2022, 23, 24, 25. So in 22, we had 5 million home sales last year. We're going to have 4.2 million home sales this year. That's less, that's fewer, right? You guys got that. Then we're gonna go up the year after that to 4,700 or 4.7 million home sales. Then we're gonna go back up to 5.2 million, which oh. is more than we had in 22, which was the highest in the history of the planet, right? And that's two years from now going up. So this is that one opportunity to buy the dips or whatever you wanna call it because of this. So 641,000 new homes, 659, 6, 6, uh, 693, and 740 thousand new home builds going on in the marketplace, which is pretty cool. And then interest rates are average 6.6, .6, right? 5.6 by the end of the year, expected to 4.8 and then 4.5 in 25, right? So the next few years look really good from a, a pent up demand of buyers. Holy cow. Pent up demand. And that's what we're talking about right now. So do you, you want to buy when people are scratching their head? or when everyone's in a crazy frenzy, right? So this is the zoom in of that one right there. So these are the housing metrics, existing home sales, new home sales, and 30 year fixed rates projections. Well, as, as a brokerage, we hunkered down for 2023 because we knew it was gonna suck. So you can't take, right. you can't take a thousand, a million units out of the market because most real estate brokerages, what was that stat I saw the other day? Just in our MLS, there's 6,000 brokerage companies. Right. Right. And only 300 of those are franchised, like Century 21 or Cobalt Banker. Right. And, and the 300 franchise companies outproduce the other independents by a three to one margin, easy. Right. Right. So the, my point is most agents don't do much. The good agents do a lot. So the good agents are, have got to have less business because you're losing a million home sales across the country. But it's really encouraging to see back to 4.7 million in 2024 because we'll make it fine through 2023. Well, it's not that we lost a million home sales this year. It's just that they were front loaded into last year because people well, that were thinking about last year was, was, was such a misconception, right? It was so it was such an anomaly that we were just smart enough to know this isn't going to last forever. Let's enjoy it. But let's be realistic as we head into 2023 that it's probably going to be different than it was in 2022, right? right? There are a lot of brokers out there, a lot of companies that said, "Oh my God, this is the new normal. This is amazing. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna be the richer than we ever have been." And then now this year is gonna smack them right in the face and say, "Nope, oh, hey <laughs> idiot, you uh, you know this is like hitting the lottery in 2022." So, yeah. but the good news is these projections are showing. We might have another chance of hitting the lottery again here in a couple of years. <laughs> right. Because 800,000 people bought last year that were planning on buying this year, but did it early because it was very incentivizing to do so. So that's all we did is we took sales that were going to happen this year and moved them into last year. And it is what it is. Right. So that's where we are. But things are looking good. So those are the slides we have for today. And our goal is to share reality with you and about what's going on in real estate today. What's really going on? and real estate today, because the moral of the story is if you have a, an, an idea, if your home is not perfect, this is a really good time to go get the perfect home. 
And you're not that, a tree. You can move. That's right. <laughs> I like because, that line. Because you can refinance and you can get some concessions. You can get some rate buy downs. You can get into an ARM products. There's all kinds of affordability if you have the right people guiding you. Right. So don't let the headlines mess with you. Right. It's about just thinking about doing what's right for you at this moment. So if there is a move coming in your future in the next year or two, you really ought to consider doing it now because it's in your best interest to do so. Right? That's the what the numbers are showing. And even if it's a couple hundred bucks extra a month right now, it's going to more than balance out when you have good guidance and good agenting behind you there. So what's your closing thoughts, gentlemen? I just want to mirror what you said. There you go. There you go. Hola. Hey man, it's just it, you have to you have to take a logical step back for you. Everyone's situation is different. Everyone's goals are different. But if you are not having these conversations with the people that matter most to you, your spouse, your family, whatever you need to be, and then have the conversation with your agent. And if your agent is not communicating with you about these types of things and helping guide you and advise you, you need a new agent. Right. That this is what they're there for. They are not there to show you around. They're not a tour guide. They you can figure out where the kitchen is without them. That is not their value. And if your agent has presented themselves as that being their value, you need a new agent. So now's the time. Right. That's right. And as always, if we can guide you, reach out. We've got you covered throughout the whole state easily and then around the whole country and the whole world with our referral network. So you need somebody you can trust, you got it with us. And we're always here to empower, educate, and encourage you guys. And thank you for watching. We'll see you next episode. Real estate today. And give us give us a like, um, hit the subscribe button, give us a comment um, when you're watching this one because A, it helps the algorithms get us some more attention. And um, we hope the value is helpful for you and for your friends as well. So we always appreciate you guys. Thanks for watching.